Hello everybody and welcome to the section on language and language manipulation. This presentation will include the following topics, cognitive and emotive meanings, euphemisms and dysphemisms, tone, slanting, weasel words, fine print, obfuscation, control of definitions, language reform, and PC terminology. Language is incredibly important. We often think in terms of language. Sometimes we think in pictures and images and motion, but very often, perhaps most often, we think in terms of words or at least in terms of concepts that we fundamentally understand in terms of words. In the book 1984, George Orwell's Dystopia made use of something called Newspeak. In, in this Newspeak, manipulating language so as to help control the thoughts of the population. One of the basic principles of Newspeak was to remove shades of meaning and to leave only simple concepts. So instead of saying something, uh, instead of having modifiers like um, good or normal intensifiers such as that, people would use the word plus to say something was better. If you want to say something was much, much better, they would say double plus. So hopefully this would be a double plus presentation. Cognitive versus emotive meanings. Words are not simple things. They convey much more information than their technical or dictionary definitions alone. Further, they can convey informations with both the way they are said and by the context within which they are said. In terms of cognitive versus emotional meanings, while we often think of words in terms of definitions only, we both choose, the wo choose words and are influenced by words that other people say based on their emotional content as well. The cognitive meaning of the word is what you think of as the definition. It is the concept, the thing, the event, the action, and so forth. The emotive meaning is the positive or negative connotation of that particular word or phrase. There are more to words than just their technical definitions. Words convey all sorts of information. They convey technical conceptual information as well as emotive information. A person might be described as clever or that same person might be described as cunning. A person might be described as inebriated or as drunk. A person might be described as confident or as pompous, and so forth. One way to illustrate the difference in emotional content between words and terms is the so-called I, you, he, or she game. It goes like this. You apply a positive term to yourself, a more neutral or sometimes slightly negative one to somebody else, indicated by the second person pronoun you, and then a term with the same meaning but a very negative connotation to a third person identified as he or she. So here are a few examples. I'm brave. You're a risk taker. He's a reckless idiot. I sparkle, you perspire, he sweats like a pig. Uh, interesting note here, pigs don't really sweat very much, that's why they wallow in mud, but nevertheless the phrase lives on. Finally, I'm lost in contemplation, you're distracted, he's oblivious. Euphemisms refer to words or phrases with a positive connotation used to substitute for something that has a more negative connotation. The military is especially notorious for this. The term Department of Defense was actually changed in 1947 for what was previously called the Department of War. Collateral damage sounds a lot less emotional than innocents killed during the war, or targets unintentionally destroyed. Friendly fire is a way of saying that one is getting shot at by troops from one's own side, but the fire doesn't seem that friendly to those getting shot at. A preemptive strike is a nicer way of saying to attack first. The phrase enhanced interrogation became big during the Bush administration's attempt to make the use of torture seem more acceptable. To deploy troops is to send out an invasion force. Here are some non-military examples. In the Victorian era, and for quite some time after, and the term still survives today, People had to use the phrase white meat because the phrases breast or leg 
were too sexual to say in a restaurant when asking for food. Life insurance really protects one against death. Detention facilities or prisons. Capital punishment is nicer than saying the death penalty. Corporal punishment means physically hitting. Uh, voters who are disenfranchised or denied the right to vote or the denied the right to have their vote counted. And one of my friend's very favorite words, and so I included it here, is the word calipigian, which actually means to have shapely buttocks. And yes, there actually is a word for that. And here's one I just found out about the other day. Apparently, Chilean sea bass is a euphemism for Patagorian toothfish. Evidently, Patagorian toothfish were not very appealing on the menu, and so it was changed to Chilean sea bass. They're quite tasty, but I guess nobody really wanted to order a toothfish. Dysphemisms are the opposite of euphemisms. While euphemisms are used to put a positive spin on ideas, actions, things, and concepts, dysphemisms are terms used to put negative spins on things. Here are some examples. The term piracy has been used by the recording industry, movie industry, and others to describe people who make copies of information in violation of copyright law. The term has become a regular part of our language now, but it has and was meant to have a negative connotation. Pirates were known for boarding ships and killing people and taking their property in order to sell it. Regardless of what we think about the morality of copyright infringement, one has to agree that there is a difference between murdering somebody to get their cargo and then selling it for profit and copying somebody else's idea, often for personal use or just copying data. Again, this isn't to say that the later is morally okay, only that it's clearly different from boarding somebody's ship, killing everybody on board, and taking their stuff. To claim that somebody is bumming money is a negative way of saying that they are asking for money. The phrase solicit often has a negative connotation. It means to unwantedly or uninvitedly um, attempt to promote or sell a good or service or idea. Calling somebody a vagrant is a more negative than calling that person homeless. Saying that a person is ignorant is more negative than saying that that person is uneducated in a particular matter. Okay, here are two great examples. The first is a George Carlin piece. This is the more humorous of the two. I suppose not surprising since he's a comedian. The second is a TED Talk by Kate Burridge, which goes in more, into more detail about the processes evolved in generating euphemisms. Especially interesting in this one is the explanation about why there are so many bad words. Um, and part of this is often that when there's a substitution for a word that's considered bad, those euphemisms are considered okay for a while, but then they become substituted so much that a new euphemism starts to be needed to become replaced for them because those start to become bad words um, and so on. And so you end up with all these new words being added to the dictionary. So I'll wait a moment for you to go on to the next slide so that you can hit pause. Um, click on the images to hyperlink to the videos. Click back to continue to the presentation. Remember that the pause option can be found by mousing down to the bottom of the screen. It might vary by your version of PowerPoint. So I'll just delay for a bit so you can find that pause. And I'll just count down. Five, four, three, two, and one. Tone refers to the emotional connotation of a passage or a piece as a whole. If you understand the ideas of cognitive meaning, emotive meaning, euphemisms, dysphemisms, the only new idea here is that tone refers to a passage or larger piece, while those other terms refer to the emotive or emotional connotations of individual words or terms. Below are some common rhetorical tones, authoritative, empathetic, inquisitive, concerned, condescending, contemplative, earnest, evaluative, 
humorous, indignant, indulgent, irreverent, sarcastic, scholarly, urgent, and I'm sure you can think of lots more. Not all tones are designed to be manipulative. For example, what might be described as a scholarly tone would be a tone designed to take emotion out of a piece and as a deliberate attempt to use neutral language. Many people do not find such pieces as exciting to read, but almost all professional journals are written this way. And the reason why is because it is so important in assisting rational evaluation of the material. Such a tone does not guarantee a piece is unbiased, not even close. Information can be left out, information can be manipulated. Nevertheless, it goes a long way to producing a more objective environment. Many scientists, for example, are certainly animal lovers. But when a scientist describes the hunting habits of savannah lions, she or he doesn't talk about how the mean lions are attacking helpless gazelles. Instead, the hunting habits are described using neutral language that helps to promote objective investigation of the behavior. Slanting. There are two different but related forms of slanting. The first is when a true statement is used to suggest something untrue. The second is the deliberate selection of facts, in other words, true statements, in order to imply something untrue. Advertisers are notorious for this. There are thousands and thousands of examples of this. So this is just one. Um, this one's from a product called Juicy Juice by Nestle. What does the text on this bottle imply? 100% juice, orange, tangerine. Sure seems to suggest that this is 100% orange and tangerine juice. Nope, look at the ingredients. It's 100% juice, but it's mostly apple juice. Actually, it isn't even really 100% pure juice either. Juice companies are allowed to say 100% juice, even though the process they use to preserve many of the juices removes most of the flavors, and so they actually put in a perfume ingredient. Um, for example, orange juice has almost no flavor because of the preservation process, so they add this additive. The additive is made from oranges, though it is by no means juice, and the companies, um, well, the companies in the U.S. at least, are allowed to say it's 100% juice anyways. This is why different brands of orange juice are actually taste different. Oranges should all taste the same, you know, varying with degrees of freshness. Um, but some orange juices taste different. Some taste more like candy than others, for example, because they each have their own patented additives. Um, if you like, you can click on the um, block link below for more information about this. Um, you don't have to view this, whatever, but I just included the link. Um, real quick countdown, five, four, three, two, and one. In fact, the images of brands themselves can also be misleading. You see a McDonald's sign and buy fries, and you think that they will be the same McDonald's fries anywhere. Not so. The U.S. has some of the most lax food regulation laws of the major industrialized world. If you buy McDonald's fries in the U.S., for example, you are getting all sorts of additives not allowed or tolerated in other countries. Indeed, many U.S. food companies make inferior products to sell to U.S. citizens, and the same companies make superior products to here to sell and ship overseas. Those listed on this page are just a drop in the bucket. It's interesting that many of these same companies will use patriotic messages to sell their goods in the U.S. Patriotism in those cases seems to simply be a way of manipulating Americans into spending money while at the same time actually treating them worse than they treat their own customers elsewhere. If you wish, you can click on the link below to find out more about this. It's by no means necessary. Um, the point of including this is to simply show how images and so forth can also be used as a form of slanting and also to tie this back into previous ways that fallacies and images and so forth can be used to manipulate the rational thought process. Okay, weasel words. Weasel words is a term for words or phrases used to reduce the actual value of the content of a statement without appearing to do so. 
In other words, they tend to give the speaker or writer a significant amount of wiggle room to squeeze out of what she or he is appearing to say. Below are some common methods of this. Middle or passive voice is often employed for weasel words. Instead of saying, I argue that, one says, it could be argued that. Or instead of saying, I reason or I conclude, the speaker may say, it stands to reason or it is reasonable to believe and so forth. Another very common weaseling method is, to, is the use of anonymous authority. One might say, it is agreed that, oh really? Agreed by who? Saying it is agreed makes it sound like those who matter are agreeing, or that experts agree. Instead, maybe it's just Joe and Smith who agree, and Joe and Smith might not know anything about the subject at all. Or the use of a generic phrase like experts for example. Another way of weaseling is to use a bunch of qualifying words, words like some or many or lots. These leave room for exceptions. Of course, sometimes there is a legitimate reason to limit the scope of one's state statements, but sometimes such terms are used as a method of escaping responsibility for what one is saying. Rhetorical questions can also be used as a method of weaseling. If I want to imply something, is true, or may be true, I can ask it as a question without ever saying I'm actually suggesting it's true myself. Say, Mr. Rig Rigby, is there any truth to the claim that you have a dogfighting ring in your basement? I'm not saying it's true, but just asking the question implies that it is. Remember the push-pull that we talked about in a previous PowerPoint where people were asked that they would be more or less likely to vote for McCain if they were to find out that he had an illegitimate black child. Of course, the question didn't actually say that he had such a child. There was no reason to think that he did. But merely asking the question implied that there was some truth to it. And that was the whole point of doing it. They were trying to sabotage his campaign. So here are a few Weasley examples. Compare, he is the foremost climate expert in the U.S. to, he is arguably the foremost climate expert in the U.S. Or, I will not vote for a bill that deregulates clean drinking water standards. To, I have no plans to vote for a bill that deregulates clean drinking water standards. Or, this vacation wasn't paid for by the fossil fuel industry. To, to my knowledge, this vacation wasn't paid for by the fossil fuel industry. Notice that especially this last one, um, people often will deliberately keep themselves ignorant of certain facts so that they can make claims like this. One of the, uh, the phrases uh, used to indicate this is uh, plausible deniability. Um, you may have heard this phrase before. And again, here's George Carlin. He's a comedian that does or did a lot of comedy about language. And this piece directly relates to weasel words, so I decided to include it as well. Please pause to watch this and then continue the PowerPoint after. Once again, I'll delay. Five, four, three, two, and one. Fine print. Fine print can be used to hide the truth where people don't tend to see it. In this particular ad, it is combined with a misleading image as well. The image shows a child and a woman in a pool holding an inflatable ball. But when you look at the described size of the ball, it is only a little over 10 inches in diameter. I just eyeballed it by shrinking a version of the ball, so this ball is a little bit smaller than the one you see here, um, and I did that because the woman's standing a little bit behind the boy. Um, and then I took them and I stacked them together and it took about four of them to equal the woman's height. Four times 10.6 inches is 42.4 inches. Divide this by 12 inches and a foot for this picture and you end up with the woman being roughly 3.5 feet tall if that's an accurate image. So it seems highly unlikely that this is an accurate image. Um, Nevertheless, the fine print here tells you the size of the ball. 
very misleading. Um, and if you want to, you can go to this link at the bottom with it says mouseprint.org. They have a whole bunch of examples of things like this. Here is just one more example. And again, there are thousands and thousands of examples like this. Briars very recently changed their product. They used to sell ice cream. Now most of their desserts are not actually ice cream at all. But this is difficult to tell from the packaging. Compare the old package to the new package. If you didn't look carefully, you'd think you were buying the exact same product you always had. But not so, not even close. The old product was ice cream. The new product is frozen dairy dessert, whatever that means. The old product was all natural. The new product now says quality since 1886. This is misleading in several ways. First, it's misleading because it looks like the old package. Second, it's misleading since it implies that they're using the same basic recipe as 1866, but they're not since in 1866 they were selling ice cream and whatever this is, it doesn't even legally qualify as ice cream by our legal standards. The third is that the word quality is, you guessed it, a weasel word. What does quality mean here? All products are a quality of some sort or, or another. Quality here is a completely empty word. Any product of any quality is of quality. I could put the word quality on anything. As long as it exists, it has quality. On well, in case you're interesting, here are the compared ingredient lists. That was the original. Um, you can essentially comprehend what was in the original ingredients list. Here's the new one. Um, the new ingredients list is significantly longer and contains a bunch of words you'll likely have to Google. Um, again, for more information, if you want, you could click at this link at the bottom of the story. Um, but it's not something you have to do. It's just in case people are interested in sources or in more, inf uh, in more information. Um, if not, go ahead and continue. In the last case, we already saw a little bit of obfuscation mixed in with the fine print. To obfuscate is to obscure something so as to make it difficult to understand or to perceive or in some other way detect. Camouflage is a form of visual obfuscation. It doesn't make something invisible, it makes it harder to detect. In rhetoric, what we are talking about is terms and phrasing and linguistic constructions that are designed to conceal intention and meaning rather than to help clarify what is being said. Fine print is often used to obfuscate. Sometimes so-called legalese itself can be a form of obfuscation. Binding terms are hidden in long agreements, often in fine print, obscured by terms that are difficult to understand if one doesn't have a law degree, and put inside things like point and click agreements, which people are not really expected by producers to read, but which those same producers expect the courts to find binding. If, for example, a company had the power to force all people to read its point and click agreements before signing them, it's unlikely they would. People wouldn't want to read through that much and rather than being forced to do so, they would likely choose the product of a company that didn't force them to do so. And if all companies force people to do so, then it's likely that people would buy far fewer products because few people would have the time to commit to reading 30 minutes and then spending two hours looking up legal terms and making sure they understood them before buying their Nets 499 iPad game. Companies know that people are not reading their agreements. They don't really expect them to but nevertheless, they also know that courts tend to enforce them, at least within certain limits, and this makes them an ideal sort of hiding place or obfuscation place to put in certain terms um, that they realize that people might not willingly sign if they just knew that they were there. Below is a link to an article about some of the fine print agreements that you may have already signed but be unaware of. And of course, there are lots of these out here. This, um, uh, this little article just talks about six of them. Again, this isn't something you really have to read. It's just something I thought you might be interested in, and it was a source I used, so I included it. 
Here is a video example of obfuscation. The character Sir Humphrey in the comedy series Prime Minister and Yes Prime Minister is a master of obfuscation. Nobody can spend as many words saying absolutely nothing as Sir Humphrey can. Here is just one example from the series. Compare the clarity of his first statement with his second, which is simply you lied. Though it might be noted from a philosophical point of view that the minister in this series probably couldn't rightly be said to have been lying. To lie, after all, is to intentionally deceive, and in this case the minister was ignorant of the facts and believed he was telling the truth, um, although Humphrey is right that the news would say he was lying. Anyway, that's beside the point. You can follow the hyperlink by clicking on the image. Just click back into the PowerPoint when you're finished, and the PowerPoint should continue. I'll count down from five, four, Three, two, and one. The control of definitions can be of profound importance. Controlling the definitions of words can help frame a debate. We already saw in a previous PowerPoint how changing the definition of unemployment can make unemployment figures look better or worse. Both sides of the abortion debate accuse the other of manipulating definitions in terms of their group names pro-life versus anti-abortion, or pro-choice versus option to terminate pregnancy, or more extreme definitions I'm sure you've heard of. Many companies fight to keep legal definitions for terms like organic and natural for foods vague so that they can use them to sell products without those terms putting too much of a limit on what is actually in the product. The movement to eliminate education regarding evolution, large swaths of geology because it says the earth is old, astronomy, and biology from public schools, stopped calling itself creation science because of religious connotations, and started calling itself intelligent design, and then later started calling itself just ID theory in order to distance itself from these religious connotations. Here is a very recent example in which John Oliver discusses how definitions are manipulated by the government regarding drone strikes. A delay before going on to the next slide so you can pause the presentation, click the image to hyperlink to the video, then click back to resume. Five, four, three, two, and one. Because definitions are so important, and because of the effect that language has upon people's attitudes and reasoning, extensive political efforts are often made to consciously reform language. Common targets for language reform are often racist and sexist language. For example, words like mail carrier are now used instead of mailman, and police officer instead of policeman, and department or board chair instead of chairman, and so forth. It was argued that the use of gender-specific words in these cases implied that only men should or could fulfill these roles. That a woman applying for a job such as police man was inherently at a disadvantage merely because of the job title. Defenders of the old terminology often appealed to tradition or common practice, and we discussed those as fallacies before. Or they would point out that, look, people really know that the word man can apply to women as well. But people were concerned, however, that in spite of how these terms can be used, that using them in a gender, in a way that implies something gender specific, would have subtle effects on the hiring of women and on the way women are treated. Which do you think is the case? One thing to note is that it's really quite easy to underestimate the importance of language and its subtle effects on us. For example, people really know that hurricanes do not have sexes. They don't sexually reproduce. And many people that are going to be affected by what I'm going to talk about don't think of themselves as sexist, and in fact, a huge portion of them are women themselves. Nevertheless, it turns out to be the case that more people die in storms named after women than in storms named after men because people underestimate the power and danger of storms named after women. On average, storms named after women are no more dangerous than storms named after men. People just take them less seriously because they have female names. If I was ever in charge of a football team, I think I would change the name to the Pink Fuzzy Cuddle Bunnies 
so that all the opposing teams would underestimate them and it would give us an advantage on the field. Not to mention that it would just be hilarious to hear about other teams named after savage animals such as bulls, jaguars, bears, lions, falcons, and so forth being beaten by the fuzzy pink cuddle bunnies. Of course, PC, short for politically correct, terms can sometimes go too far in an effort either not to discriminate or not to defend. For example, the phrase African American has in many quarters fallen out of favor for two reasons. One, many Caucasians come from Africa and become U.S. citizens, and the term was not meant to cover those people. Nevertheless, many of them would check the boxes on forms that said African American because that's exactly what they were. They were Caucasians who came from Africa and became Americans. Um, number two, because many people who were meant to be covered by the term did not actually have African ancestry or were not, in fact, Americans, but were on visas and so forth. In the Kate Burridge piece linked to earlier, she pointed out that the word bunny came about as a replacement because the previous term sounded too much like slang for a female body part. It didn't refer to this part. Nevertheless, the mere fact that it sounded like it was enough so that the, the letter B became substituted. And then we had bunny. Indeed, some terms have cost people their jobs not because they were racist or because their users intended them in a racist way, but merely because they sounded similar to racist words. The entomology, that is to say the root or history of the word, had nothing to do with racist words that they sounded like. The meaning of the words were completely different, but the public outcry was enough to run careers. And that ends the presentation, or perhaps in the spirit of this particular PowerPoint, I should say that that temporarily suspends the current educational procedure contingent upon a re-engagement of intellectual activities after a half fortnight's intermission. Until next time.